Yeah, thank you so much for um, coming and listening to my presentation. I want to give you an update on Mammoth Biosciences. Last time I presented at the meeting at, at the MESA, and there have been some things uh, where we made progress that I want to talk to you about today. So coming back, what is so important and, and what is different? Um, as we know, there are so many CRISPR companies out there, right? What we believe is different, what Mammoth does, is that we have these two areas where we invest heavily in. One is diagnostics using CRISPR technology invented in Jennifer Doudna's lab. And then also working on therapeutics, so permanent cures. I mean, that would be the dream for many of us, I guess. Um, but we're also looking into other aspects. Um, I will come back to the diagnostics with one slide at the end because I think it's, it's very fascinating how CRISPR technology can be used here. So the foundation of the company is really a discovery um, that looks into discovering novel CRISPR systems. And that just some mentioned here. We focus on uh, systems like Cas14, Casfees, and we'll show you more detail on those. Um, we believe they have huge advantages for in vivo delivery. Um, you will see why very soon. Um, they also have very distinct properties that you need for the diagnostics. And that's actually the motivation when the company started as a diagnostics company to look into a lot of variety of these systems. And I will show you um, some, some aspects why that is very important. And then intellectual property, you saw the recent news on the Cas9 IP. Um, it's definitely not over the game, right? But these systems that Mammoth is focusing on are all outside of Cas9. And we have the exclusive right for the foundational IP out of UC Berkeley for those. So when we look at the CRISPR system, we really look at this as a search engine. So you hear like in like Google, whatever, right? I mean, you would give in a disease or whatever. You have like a DNA, RNA aspect. And then you can modify DNA or RNA with various aspects. So you can read. That's the diagnostics part. But you can do other stuff. I mean, you can knock out, right, and modulate. And, and then all these other modalities like base editing and so on. They're all building on this search engine that you potentially couple to something like a deaminase in case of base editing, or you do other modifications there. So coming back to the protein discovery group, this is really, I mean, a variety of samples that we look at at the metagenomic data here. And this is going from Antarctica to Mariana Trench, um, animals, wild animals, uh, domestic animals, human, lakes, volcanoes, and so on, right? I mean, it's really extremely diverse, and we sign deals there as well to get access, potentially exclusively. And then we have a uh, proprietary algorithm, how we kind of look at these and try to identify these novel CRISPR systems. And, and when we say there are hundreds or thousands of, right? I mean, sometimes investors get like shocked because they think, oh man, that means there could be hundreds of thousands of companies as well, right? But that's not true. No, only a very few then qualify for being used in these applications. So you have to further filter these down. And that's when like biochemistry and so on kicks in to further look at these. And I mentioned earlier, you can then use these in, in various aspects. We internally focus right now on diagnostics and therapeutics, but as you know, CRISPR can be used in other areas as well. So the team constantly growing. This is the leadership team. And compared to last October, recently, um, Elaine Sun joined us as chief financial officer and chief operating officer. Um, most recently, she worked at Hellozyme as CFO. And so you see that we get ready, right? I mean, IPO readiness, I mean, that's the catchword. Who knows when something would happen, right, in these environments, but at least you want to be ready. And you see the investors as well. It's a very interesting mixture. Um, but you see, again, the differentiation of the company having these two aspects of diagnostics, which is more like a, an, a device, right, electronics. It's combined with the smartphone, potentially to report the results and so on. Um, so you see here, like, more technology-focused investors, distribution, right, as well, Amazon and so on on here. But then also the traditional therapeutics investors like Redmile, Foresight, and so on. Um, over the years, the company is now uh, four years old. Um, you see the growth here, um, shown with the photos. And on the right, actually, next time when you come to San Francisco and you go from the airport to the city, you see on 101, you see the, the big logo. Actually, I think it's a very good story about branding a company, the, the Mammoth. I mean, you will not forget this after the talk here, right? Um, you know exactly if I would ask you what's the logo of Mammoth, you would know it. 
And you see some partnerships here where I will talk more about those. So for therapeutics, <clears throat> the roadmap, as I mentioned, in vivo, we see a lot of advantages here, and that's why we focus on this as well. And it's very common for these companies to start first with ex vivo approaches, right, to show that these systems can edit. Then you move on into in vivo internal medicine. And we have some partnerships that I will show you more about. And so why in vivo? At the bottom of this slide, you see the traditional systems, and it sounds always odd um, talking about this, but the publication for Cas9, as you might know, was exactly 10 years ago in June um, 2012. And so those are actually pretty large enzymes. If you look here, um, 1,380 for Cas9 amino acids. And that's a problem if you want to deliver these. And so the MEMA systems that we're working on at the top here, the green ones, they are much smaller, down to 400 amino acids, which is remarkable, right? If you think nature developed something which is like 1,400 amino acids at the same time over evolution of many of billion years, nature also came up with something which is the third of the size, right? And it still works. And if you look at what is needed for these things to happen, I mean, it's remarkable that it works. And on top of these discovery of natural systems, we then do protein engineering as well, right? But I will say it would be very difficult to go from a Cas9 just by protein engineering down to something like Cas14. The reason for that is actually interesting, <clears throat> and I think I don't have a slide here, but it acts as an asymmetric homodimer. So you need two of Cas14s that come together, and you would never predict this by protein engineering that you might get smaller and, you know, by creating it in that fashion that two of them come together instead of one Cas9. And that's why we first build on natural discovery and then go for protein engineering. And here, as a graphic representation, again, the size, why is it so important? If we want to deliver with an AV, for example, while vector, then you have a package a load, a loading um, restriction, right? I mean, and SP Cas9, that's the very traditional system that has been used by many of the companies now in clinical trials um, for ex vivo approaches. It's actually too large for this AV. So you need to be smaller. There's another variant, SA Cas9, which is slightly smaller. That's used for the ophthalmology approaches right now, where you have to use viral vectors so far. Um, or you use lipid nanoparticles and then express the system via mRNA. You see that on top, we can do the same thing with our systems as well. But if you have a small system like ours, it fits easily into an AV, including the guide RNAs that you also need. So now you can create an all-in-one AV and then deliver this much easier. And even if you would go for new modalities that we're exploring as well, things like base editing, where you have another protein fused to it, right? You get even bigger. It still fits into one AV. And current companies, they have to use what is called an intein split method. So you have to split the, the protein into two, deliver both parts in two AVs, and then hope that in the same cell they come together again, right? And here you would just use one, which is a huge advantage. <clears throat> Not only from the, the signs, but also cost of goods, right? If you imagine the AV, you only need half and so on. So that's a huge advantage, but also for the non vial delivery, if you can imagine if your payload is smaller, you can package much more into one lipid, right? And still, one lipid needs to go into the cell, right? Needs to survive and so on. So it's, it's, there's increases and chances of success if you have smaller systems. And mRNA is actually easier to create as well. Another aspect that came due to the fact that the company started as a diagnostics company, when I will show you how this works, you, you have to have this PEM sequence next to the cutting side, right? And for diagnostics, you don't want to be limited. You want to find a sequence in your DNA or RNA at any point, right? You don't want to be limited. You can only look here, here, and here, right? And that's why the company was looking for PEMless systems that don't have this requirement. But that's also helpful in the therapeutic space if you have less restriction, because then you can target more in the, in the human genome, right? And you see this illustrated here on the right side, that with the mammal systems, again in green, you have much more flexibility and can address many more diseases than potentially, right? Right now, if you look at all the diseases that CRISPR companies work on, maybe that's 30 overall or so, right? I mean, they all work on similar, you know, all, everybody works on sickle cell and so on. If you want to go beyond that, you might need different systems, right? And then this is only one data slide here. Um, this is on T-cell editing. 
It's a very common target that we used here. On the left, you see a single edit comparable to Cas9, over 90% what we can achieve. On the right side, you see a multiplex edit, so it's three edits at the same time, so in one pot, if you will. Um, and you still get overall an average on 94% and even beyond now. I mean, we have further optimized this. The team will go out over summer now and present at the scientific conferences, starting with ASGCT in May. And then the two partnerships. And so one of the partnerships with Vertex, as you know, already a huge player in the CRISPR field. So that was very important for us to partner with a company that understands the field, right? They know the requirements. They were looking for better systems for in vivo. So that's where we partner with them. Um, and you see the, the economics here out of the press release. Um, it's only two indications. So they are named, but we are unfortunately not allowed to disclose them right now. But that's very important as well, right? You don't want to give away a, a whole field very early in the company building. Um, at the same time, you need these partners to accelerate systems, right? I mean, they have all the expertise, um, not only the, the editing in this case, what they can work with us together and, and help us to grow, but also the regulatory part, the disease knowledge, animal models are available, and so on, right? So that's a huge benefit here. And then the second partnership that we announced in in January of this year, and actually the previous one, if I could just go back, Vertex B announced October 26, so it was a week after the meeting on the Mesa, right? Um, so I was talking about partnerships, but we signed those as well. And then the second one with Bayer, again, five indications in this case. Um, we're starting in the liver, we cannot disclose the diseases, um, but again, all are named, right? So the, the diseases are fixed, and we know exactly what we can work on in the future internally, but also what we can potentially partner outside. So just want to show the, the diagnostics quickly because I think it's uh, very fascinating as well. And you can imagine a lot of links, right? I mean, you also need to detect these diseases. You can think about detecting rare diseases as well. But the main focus right now is infectious diseases. And you can imagine we also added uh, the COVID um, detection to that. We received an EUA, um, the emergency use authorization for a high throughput test. But the end game for us is really this at home um, device, right? I mean, as I showed earlier. So how does it work? So you have these special Cas proteins, and they have a different property than, for example, Cas9. This would, would not work with Cas9. So instead of cleaving the DNA or RNA, it cleaves only outside single-stranded DNA in this case, right? You see it here on the left. And now you're using a probe single-stranded DNA and only if the guide RNA identifies the sequence that you're looking for in the DNA or RNA, then this cutting mechanism starts. And, but it's a, it's a kind of like, it not only cuts once, but it cuts multiple times as well. And so you have a natural amplification. And then on the right side, you see this here, you have these reporter single-stranded DNAs. And because they are cut, then you can generate a signal with that. And that makes it like so specific, right? I mean, now only as that sequence was present, you get the signal. And it's very similar to PCR from that specificity point. And you can very simply, can, you can change it by changing the guide RNA only, right? You use the same system. So when the, the variants of COVID came, right? I mean, we just within two days, we have a new test available that can now detect a new variant, right? And it's very simple. It's kind of like programming really the the DNA or RNA detection. And then, as I mentioned here, so the future is really what we see um, to have these tests. And as you can imagine, um, one of the goals is bring down the cost of goods here, right? I mean, initially, everything is expensive. I mean, engineering is complex and so on. But when the costs go down, think about it when you have the flu in the future, right? I mean, you don't know. Is it something like COVID? There might be new diseases, right? Um, then you can very simple, in 15 minutes, you get a readout, right? Is it the flu or not? Is it COVID or not? And all that can be multiplexed as well, right? You can just add multiple guides. And so um, very easy readout and, and fast. And yeah, I mean, so overall, the company, as you saw, is still growing. I didn't mention this, but 145 employees right now. And um, we're trying to build both the differentiated platform for diagnostics and therapeutics really with a strong focus on in vivo. We're still open for partnering. Um, you saw the two partnerships, right? I mean, for a small company, that's a lot, but we're still open. Um, looking more for 
partnerships where we also have co-development, co-commercialization in the future as part of becoming also an internal company. And at the same time, we are also open for licenses or partnerships in the ex vivo space. Those are mainly non-exclusive, where we're looking more kind of like to really democratize the CRISPR system and help others to, to get to something and overcoming the limitation of the intellectual property with Cas9. Uh, thank you for your attention.